persons who believe and say that they are in cabinet at his behest and it is to him and him alone that they must account. This sets up an alliance, the strongest alliance in the cabinet and it is destructive and divisive. Meanwhile, Dr. Douglas strongly, strongly objects to elected members caucusing. An example was the matter of the recommendations of the committee which had been assembled to advise on parliamentary salaries and allowances. <clears throat> Some of the elected members, including myself, had met once or twice to consider and discuss these recommendations. Dr. Douglas told us angrily, I do not want ministers caucusing. He felt that by meeting to discuss this important matter, we were undermining and disrespecting him. Well, what I would like to know is whatever happened to freedom of association and freedom of speech? Whatever happened to people's right, indeed their responsibility, to discuss matters of importance to them? Here we are, labor leaders, encouraging and urging freedom of speech and association, encouraging and urging workers to freely discuss matters to do with their own well-being and to organize themselves into collective arrangements and admonishing employers to be more sympathetic towards and supportive of workers and their collectives. And the leader of the Labour Party and the Labour government is telling us Labour government ministers elected by those same workers that we must not sit together and discuss somebody else's recommendations regarding our salaries and our allowances and the well-being of our families. The very thing of which Labour is all about is the very thing that Dr. Douglas wanted to order ministers of the cabinet, people elected by the masses of this country, not to do. It was enough to make the words of the skeptical elders back in 1989 ring out in my ears. All of this has been happening under the chairmanship, as I said, of a gentleman who has described himself, in effect, as the minister of everything, which means that, in effect, if he is the minister of everything, each and every one of the other ministers, elected or not, is a minister of nothing. This perception, together with the attitude and behavior which flow from it, makes a mockery of the concept of cabinet's res collective responsibility. This approach is disrespectful to elected persons, to the thousands of people who voted for them and against them, to the unelected persons, to the Labour Party and to democracy. It is also a fundamental breach and betrayal of the cornerstone covenant of Labour, which is that the rank and file, the ordinary people, must always be included, always be enlightened, always be embraced and empowered directly and through their elected representatives. The Labour Party's leadership is morally and philosophically bound to respect, not reject, to energize, not marginalize, and to include, not exclude, its rank and file and those persons who represent them. And so with respect I say that Dr. Douglas's leadership has fractured the critical connection between himself and the elected members of cabinet between cabinet and party leadership, and between party leadership and party base. He has not done justice to the legacy of Labour's leaders of yesteryear. And were it not for a strong basic fabric, and for the commitment, faithfulness, and dedication of a number of persons, the party could have been in bad shape. In addition, he has all too often acted out his rage and vindictiveness on persons who have been faithful to the Labour Party and to making Labour government look good and do good. Persons undeserving of such rage and vindictiveness. While he has given succor to the mediocre, to the mischievous, to the manipulative and to the psychophants. And he has also over the years developed the image of being accommodating towards certain expatriate persons who act with disdain and who are widely seen as being terribly disadvantageous towards the people of this country. These are not the right features for the face of a true leader 
of the Labour Party and the Labour government. And unlike Bradshaw and Southwell, whose stature and credibility loomed steadfastly large, imposing and impressive through their lifetimes, and whose legacy is nothing short of gigantic even today, 30 years and counting after their passing, the stature and image of Dr. Douglas have diminished, both at home and abroad, even now that he is still in office and has become the center of much negative attention. None of this is good for him, and it is even worse for the Labour Party and for the government. Further, as his team of image builders works faithfully, many people have been troubled by his recent comment in the media that if people got to know him, they would realize what a nice, caring person he is. They are asking, after 20 years in public life and 14 years as the country's prime minister, how is it that the real Douglas is still unknown to the people? So, dear citizens and residents, having had the experiences that I've had, after years of assessing, after years of optimism and hope that things and people would change for the better, after years of trying, after years of plodding on for the good that I can do in my small way for the people of my constituency and for the people of the country, I came to the painful conclusion that the skeptical elders were correct and that Dr. Douglas's intention was always to make sure that the party was more of him than he was of the party. For him, it is to be called the Denzel Douglas Labour Party more than the Labour Party, the Denzel Douglas government more than the Labour Party government, and the Denzel Douglas cabinet more than the Labour Party government's cabinet. Such arrangement, such an arrangement suits his nature and suits the agenda of himself, his surrogates, his cohorts and his sponsors. That may be his version of new labor. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. That may be his version of new labor. It surely is not mine. <laughs>